Hello everyone, and you're very welcome here today for this special occasion. This is our first live event on Zoom, and we're delighted to welcome Carmely Kellig, our author, who is the author of seven books, and her latest one, right here behind me, Kevin Barry, and she's going to talk to you today about the book, read a little bit about it and from it, and speak to you a little bit about Kevin himself. We're delighted today to thank um, Bally Waltram Library with Wicklow County Library Service, who's hosting Carmel in their branch, and also to thank Hedgehog Productions, who are making all these online uh, events for the Decade of Centenaries possible. I'm the County Librarian here in Carlo, but I'm also the coordinator of the Decade of Centenaries program on behalf of Carlo County Council Centenaries Committee. And I know that the chair of the committee, Charlie Murphy, and all the councillors on the committee send their very best wishes to you all today. So without further ado, I'd like to pass you over now to Carmel and Buintanaf Gulair as an event in youth. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. My name is Carmel. And as John very kindly said there, I'm the author of this new book called Kevin Barry. Can you hear me okay there? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Great. So this is actually my talk to schools. It's school, right? Thanks for organizing this. And it's, I'm delighted as part of the Carlo Centenary celebrations. So before I go into Kevin Barry's life itself, I'd like to give you a little bit of background to that time because it was over 120 years ago and Ireland was very, a very different place then. So in the book, I've put in what we call a prologue. And this gives you details of how, what like at that time. It's undergoing a lot of very positive change. And in 1984, for example, A had been founded. In 1892, the National was founded. And then in 1893, Conra Nigelga was founded. And these societies are still with us today. The reason I'm telling you about these is because Irish culture was coming to the forefront, even though Ireland was ruled by London. And that's very important. And not only was Irish culture being revived, but also businesses throughout Ireland were passing from Protestant to Catholic hands. Um, because before this, up to about the beginning of the 20th century, businesses were dominated by Protestant businessmen. And then, then the business politics was starting to go in favour of a free, independent Ireland. And that's the Ireland that Kevin Barry was born into in 1902. So Kevin Gerard Barry was born on the 20th of January, 1902, at number eight Fleet Street in Dublin. I'm sure you've all heard of Temple Bar, well, right smack in the middle of Temple Bar is where Kevin was born. And he was the fourth of seven children born to Tom and Mary Barry. And Tom and Mary were both from the same parish in Carlow, your parish, and uh, they lived near each other in Tom Bay. And the Barry family are still there to this day. And as part of my research, for the book, I went down to meet the Barrys in Tom Bay. And it was amazing because the front room had been turned into a museum to Kevin. And also I saw things like his communion medal, photographs of him as a baby and amazing, amazing things there, which were all a great help to me when I was writing the book. So um, he was the fourth of seven children and his mum and dad were keen to keep the connections with County Carlow. And as was the custom of the time, he was baptised the very next day. Now, in Ireland at the moment, a baby could be six months or a year or something. But back then, Catholics believed that their baby should be baptised as quickly as possible. And he was baptised in Weston Road, the church very near their home. And Uncle Jimmy Dowling came up from Carlo, Mary Barry's brother Jimmy, and an, a neighbour called Elizabeth Brown. And they were Kevin's godparents. Now, a very important and influential lady in his life as well was a lady called Kate Kinsella, 
and Kate was the housekeeper. And again, as was custom of the time, she helped deliver the baby. The men, the dads weren't allowed in near, near the um, bedroom when the baby was being delivered, but Kate was there. And she was the one constant really in Kevin's life, in Kevin's short life. So when Kevin uh, was born in Fleet Street, he was the middle child, as I said. He had five sisters and one brother. And his brother Michael was slightly older than him. He was one to two years older than him. And unfortunately, in 1908, their dad, Tom Barry, died. And this changed everything for the family. Because up until this point, Tom Barry and his sister Judith were running a very successful dairy in Dublin. And the milk was supplied from the farm down in Tom Bay. And they were very, very successful at this. But unfortunately, uh, in February 1908, Tom died. This led Mary, uh, Tom's wife, Kevin's mom, to make a very big decision to split up the family and to bring four of the children with her back down to Tom Bay. Now, it makes sense if you think about it, because she had her mum down there in the same parish and... She could leave three of the older girls with Aunt Judith, the lady who was um, running the dairy business. And Kevin and Michael ended up going to the Ratvilly Boys School uh, at the time. So I'd like to read a little bit from the book about that because there's a whole chapter dedicated to Tom Bay, County Carlo. And you can imagine how different life was when they went back down there from, from city life in Dublin. And I'm just going to read a little bit about the Barry Farm. And I, I don't think things have changed that much in a hundred years, but let's see. The Barry Farm was primarily a dairy farm, but they also kept chickens, ducks, sheep, a horse and a donkey. They grew potatoes and turnips, carrots, onions, mangoes, wheat and oats. Twice a day in the morning and evening, the cows were milked. The boys, that's Michael and Kevin, drove the cows into the milking parlour before and after school. After milking, they transferred the milk to the dairy, which was next door to the farmhouse. There, it was drained and separated before on milk carts to Rathbilly Kingston, and from there sent to the big dairy in Dublin. Some was also churned in for tar chores. It was not hobby into the farm. The children foraged for edible fare. They plucked hail of graze fields and collected berries, gooseberries for making jam and tart. The workers gathered horse chestnuts and chased rabbits with their friends. They thrived in the freedom of country life and the wide open spaces. Fishing in the Douglas River at the bottom of the farm was a favourite recreation. I went to visit Tom Bay, they told me the river had dried up. This outdoor life suited the growing in the Douglas young boys. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there was a principal there called Edward O'Toole. And again, Edward became a major influence on Kevin's life. And in his autobiography, he dedicated a chapter to his former pupil. And Edward O'Toole was a form, was an iron aspect of uh, country life. He was on the poultry committee. committee. Uh, he... he was the captain of the first GAA team, the first Strathvilly GAA team. And as I said, he was kind of a, a male um, figure in, in Kevin's life. And Kevin and Michael went to school together in Rathvilly in S. When Kevin was 13 then, he had to go back to Dublin to go to secondary school. And he attended three different schools in Dublin. The first one was just for a few months and it was called the O'Connell Schools, very famous schools in Dublin. He went there in April 1915 for a few months and then he changed over to St Mary's College in Rathmines in September 1915 to 1916. But because the college was closed, was going to close for refurbishment, his mam decided to send him to Belvedere College and that's the one that we know most and associate most with Kevin. And Belvedere was very important as well because Kevin played hurling and he played mm -hmm. rugby team that won against Black Rock, which seemingly was the Black Rock College, was the dominant rugby team. While he was in school there, Kevin loved writing essays and he wrote a number of important essays. Now I'd like to read a little bit from one of his essays for you because 
This will give you an idea of the kind of boy he was in secondary school. In this essay entitled Prejudice, he writes about us. And that's all very much with us today as well, which he believes is worst of all. It is divided into two classes, namely that of the white man against the colored brother and that of the white man against the fellow white man of a different nation. And that was what was happening between Ireland and England. The two combined origins of very many of the world's greatest war and slaughter. So they're actually, Kevin, I'm sure you'll agree that he was very mature and so young. Now, when Kevin was in school in Dublin, he attended his first Republican rally, and that was in the Mansion House. And it was a concert um, to, to commemorate the Manchester martyrs, three men who had died many years before over in Manchester. And Many of the family believed in the FINA, which was the public for young people. But we know for a fact that he joined the Irish Volunteers in October and he joined the Dublin Brigade. And his first job was dis distributing orders around Dublin. So he would cycle around Dublin on Saturday after a rugby or a hurling match. And he would give the orders for the parades on Sunday. Sunday morning and the rally on tears. Um, in September 1919, he won a scholarship to attend UCD, and that means that he was a very, very good student. He, he um, gained very high marks in his exams in Belvedere College in his leave insert, and then he won the scholarship to go to UCD. And he completed first year medicine there between uh, September 1919 and June 1920. All the time while, while he was in Dublin, he always came down to Rathvilly for his holidays and his brother Michael was running the farm and he loved his time in Rathvilly. And if there was any uh, volunteer activity, but the volunteers wanted to overthrow, it, overthrow English rule in Ireland, Kevin was part of that raid. So the volunteers would ambush British army, take their arms and that was a very successful tactic, and usually there was no loss of life. They would get the arms and they would go away. Nobody would be hurt. But when he came back, he failed a couple of his exams, his first medical exams in UCD, and he had to come back to Dublin in September to resit. And on the 20th of September, he had heard about a planned ambush on Monk's Bakery, which sounded like an easy target. The British Army were picking up bread to bring to the local barracks. And he'd, he asked, he begged if he could be part of that, knowing that the ambush was at 11 in the morning and that his final reset was at 2. So he was very optimistic and confident that he'd get back into um, UCD to do reset his exam. Unfortunately, as we know now, things didn't go as planned. So Kevin and two other men approached the lorry, asked for the arms, and one of the British soldiers shot back. And... This resulted in mayhem. One of the uh, accounts of the day said bullets were digging up and it only lasted for less than three British soldiers died. Kevin wasn't using his own gun because he had left it down in Bay in his home and they'd issued him with a different gun and his gun was the British Army lorry and he was hoping he'd unjam the gun or at least when the, when the lorry moved away that he would run to freedom. But as the lorry was pulling away, an old lady shouted, watch out, there's somebody under the lorry. And the British story, and he was taken along for interrogation. And this interrogation became known as the torture of Kevin Barry. I'm not sure how much you know, so I'm skimming over things at the moment. And obviously a lot more detail in the book, hopefully you get a sense. Um, on the 20th of October, then, Kevin was, went on trial and he was found guilty of feloniously wounding and killing um, one of the soldiers. And shortly after that, that evening, when he went back to Mountjoy Prison, because he'd been there from the 21st of September, he was told that um, he'd been found guilty. And a week later, on the 27th of October, he was told that he would be, he would be executed by hanging he didn't want this because hanging was what was the, was the mode of execution for 
ordinary criminals and he saw himself as a soldier because the Irish volunteers had sworn an oath of allegiance to the democratically elected first doll back in January um, 1919. Unfortunately, it was at the height of the War of Independence as well. And um, as I say, Kevin wanted to be shot like a soldier and the British authorities and the British forces didn't recognise the Irish volunteers or the IRA as they became knowing af known after swearing their allegiance. They didn't recognise them, so they uh, said, no, he, he would have to be executed by hanging. So he only had from Wednesday to the Monday, really, that he knew this was going to happen to the following Monday. The, the date for the execution was set for, uh, for the 1st of November. And um, during those last days in Mount Joy, he had lots and lots of visitors. And there were other people in the um, army, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, wanted to burst Kevin out of Mount Joy, but he didn't want that himself. He wanted to die for the Republic. And also many people, including Edward O'Toole, the man I was telling you about, your, the principal of your school, uh, when Kevin was there, he wrote a letter to an MP that he knew, a member of parliament, that's equivalent to our TDs now. And uh, that MP arranged a meeting with Lloyd George, who was the prime minister, so remember Ireland moved from London, so the Prime Minister of Ireland was Lloyd George, but there was no reprieve, and Kevin didn't want that. So during those last days in Mount Joy, he was in the condemned cell. Uh, I didn't go into Mount Joy as part of my research, but I know that area has been refurbished, so um, that condemned cell isn't there anymore. So... As I said, he had a lot of visitors, and I'd like to just read a little extract from the book about one of those visitors, a very important visitor, probably his most important visitor. And this was on October 31st, the day before he was due to be executed. And here we go. At around 4.30 p.m., his mother, sister Cathy, and brother Michael arrived at the prison. How difficult a visit it must have been for all of them, realising they would never chat with him again in this life. And they were all very religious and they believed in, in an afterlife. As they were leaving, they turned around one last time and he was standing at the salute. Wearing his trench coat with the collar turned up, it was the nearest thing he had to a soldier's uniform. That walk away from her youngest son was, without doubt, the most painful walk. Mrs. Barry, memories of him as a cradling him in her arms and to keep him safe. As a young boy, playing siblings and of the more Halloween as well. Night over the years, the chill kitchen still here after as if it were then on as she faced in the loss of her son. Permanent not to let him down she held her head high she passed the british forces her pain was unbearable but she refused to break them in the corridor she chaplains for the first time he told her he was not sure if kevin knew that he was about to die as he was so cheerful she told him cannon waters can't you actually understand that my son is proud to die for the republic and what a brave woman she was. She lived until 1953 herself, and I'm sure she carried that pain with her all her life. Um, her youngest son died at such age. So a horn of November was taken, and at the time he was brought over from, from England because there was nobody in Ireland who was going to perform this um, execution. And Kevin was bur buried in the um, in an unblessed plot in um, Mount Joy. And Mrs. Barry wrote to the prison authorities and asked for her son's body, but they said no, uh, that he would he would remain there, and he did for many many years. Um, in the meantime, news spread very quickly because November first, I just hadn't thought about this when they were planning the execution was a holy day and um, it was on stay and everybody was in mass all around Ireland. Over a hundred years ago, people were a lot more religious uh, than we are now, I think. 
Harry sent a telegram down to time. She just said that Kevin had been executed at 8 o'clock. And then 11 o'clock um, in Rathvilly was uh, said in the name of Kevin Barry that day. And people read in this crime and we can't, can't have this kind of thing happening. And eventually, I, I do really believe that Kevin's death led to people going and rather than murdering and executing war. So that's the legacy, in my opinion, of Kevin Barry. Um, in Hackettstown, the tricolour flew for two days until the British forces came and they decided that they would pull it down because they didn't want celebration or celebration. The Irish Independent newspaper reports that most babies born that week, the first week, were called Kevin uh, after Kevin and as we know now lots and lots of group conditions not just in Ireland but throughout the world are called Kevin we have the Kevin Barry Common and the Kevin Barry Common is the young Fianna Fáil for students who want to follow Fianna Fáil politics and over the years it's like Ryan Tuberty as a member and Chris O'Dowd, you might know him, he's a, an Irish actor. And ultimately, they decided to fundraise and have a window in Kevin's name. And that window is today in UCD. So I said the start of the book is the prologue, giving us the background to the period. And at the end of the book, I have in memory of, or an epilogue, which means that if you'd like to tour areas with Kevin Barry here in the book, up to date, because I was doing marriage a few months ago, of course, this year in Ranvilly, the monument, a new monument will be erected. The original one was 1958. And um, we don't know if the ceremony will be on the actual date, but the monument, as far as I know, will be uh, unveiled in November. We've all heard of W.B. Yeats, very famous Irish poet. And like W.B. Yeats, whose own words were used as his epitaph or the writing on his grave. I think that Kevin's own words would make a very fitting epitaph. Just to say to you though, in one, and after lots and lots of canvassing by the National Graves Association and the Barry family and people who just thought it wasn't right, have 10 men. There were 10 men uh, hanged during the War of Independence. Kevin was the first and youngest of those 10 on the 1st of November 9th. Through lots and lots of canvassing, eventually in October 2001, 10 men were moved to Glasnevin Cemetery for their families and, um, you know, their descendants to bury uh, their loved ones pro properly in just inside the gate, if you ever get to Glasnevin Cemetery. Uh, one family decided that their loved uh, would go back down to Limerick, say locally, and uh, he's down in Ballylanders in County Limerick. And the other nine are with Kevin there in, uh, Dave Moore and Kevin are in, buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. But I think his own words, remember I told you he loved writing essays, and there are lots of examples of them in the book. And I even got to see his own handwriting when I was doing my research, which was amazing. And Ke uh, Kevin's own words were the following, and I hope you'll agree that these would make a fitting epitaph for him uh, um, on his gravestone. In a line from an essay he wrote about having ideals, so the, the essay was entitled Having Ideals, he stated, it brings out all that is good in a man and is given to history many of the noblest of its characters. And after all my research, I think those words there, Kevin's own words, sum up the man. Some people refer to him as a teenager because he was on. A few days before he was uh, ex executed, his birth to Mount Joy, and because the authorities had to check his age because legally executions couldn't happen before 18, Shortly before that, the age was 21, but the British forces had decided and the British government changed it to 18. And um, Kevin's birth had arrived in Mount Joy. And remember I told you that Kate Kinsella, the housekeeper that loved him all her life and looked after him, 
even when he was on remand, she brought him meals into Mount Joy. Um, and he loved her cooking. And um, Kate's ex marks the spot because Kate couldn't read or write. She's an amazing storyteller and balladeer. She loved Rebel Song, especially about 1798. And her ex is on Kevin Barry's um, birth certificate, certificate because she couldn't sign her name. So just to sum up, then, um, at the back of the book as well, I decided to put a chapter on ballads and poems. Because I hope if you're reading this book in school, you might learn some lines from, we all know one ballad, or people of my generation certainly do, but there are many, many more. So I've put my favourites into the book. And I've also put some poems in. And um, if you're doing research, maybe you want to write your own history book. This at the back here is the bibliography. And that shows you the books I used, the archives I visited, and also the newspapers. So hopefully there's some tips in there for yourself. If you're deciding you'd like to do some research on your area or somebody famous or somebody that you've read about. And of course, no better place to go to do your research than to your library. And the online library is still available uh, as well at the moment. If you can't get into the library physically, you can order your books and you can click and collect them at the moment. So I hope you've learned something. So look, I'm going to go into the session, Le Laurelin and Carlo. And I hope if you have some questions, I'd love to answer them. I do also have some curriculum-based activities based on the book. So I could send them maybe to you, John, afterwards. And there's just some ideas and some quizzes and things in there. So when you've read the book, you have to read the book, though, to answer the quiz. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, we have a few questions that we do for you, Carol. Um, Pierre, do you want to go first? Yeah, great. Um, are you Okay, so I grew up in County Mayo. Do you know where that is? Hi. Yeah. And, yeah, so I grew up there and it was always raining. It was always raining down in Mayo. And when we weren't doing chores, actually chapter two, the Tom Bay chapter of the book was my favourite one to write because it evoked a lot of memories of my childhood, you know, working on the farm and things like that. But I started writing because I... I when my brothers annoyed me, they were physically much stronger than me, but when they annoyed me, I decided I was going to write some poems about them. And then I would laugh with my sister and my friends about my brothers, and I'd say, oh, look, we can write a funny poem about them. So I started writing like that, rhymes. And then after that, people told me that my, writing, my stories were great, so I loved writing stories. But I waited very late to get published so um, my first book was published in 2012, and it's Osgelga with Chloe O. My website is caramelsbooks.com if you want to have a look on there. If you want to send me an email or anything, all the details are on there. Um, but what inspired me to write? I think a bit of it was boredom because it was raining and we didn't have all the kind of toys and things you have now. If it was raining, we couldn't get out to play. So um, I loved in at Blyton, and I used to read the... Um, Mallory Tower series Are you... yeah and, uh, and um, on a wet Sunday in May afternoon I'd be looking out to the rain and then I'd be reading and in it light and then I could, I could write some stories as well don't wait as long as to write stories plenty of opportunities at school uh, practice is the most important thing read the books if you'd like to write read that kind of book and um, practice, practice, practice. Thanks for that question. Anybody else? Sorry, I didn't hear that one. Your public book, your published books are your favorite, Carmel. They're wondering. Okay. I'll let I think actually, now and I'm not, not just saying this because I'm talking to Rathvili and S, but this one at the moment. Because if you're doing research, and I've done lots of research over, over the years on different people, and then I didn't bother finishing the story, but there was something about Kevin held me to write the book. Um, so I think Kevin Barry is number one, and um, there are three others. Parents are interested. 
uh, work with the local quest and borrow those. But there was Barry that I felt it's a hundred years we need to commemorate, and that's what we do with somebody's life. We don't celebrate it necessarily. We commemorate and we remember that person. And um, I have three sons myself, and when I was writing it, I was thinking about his mother a lot, and something about how short his life was and how quickly it ended, and the great, I suppose, influence going forward, and that we now have 26 counties that we didn't have when Kevin was born. So that legacy, and it was the first, this is the first book for children. So my last three books have been centenary books. So that means there's a hundred years commemoration coming up. Um, and the other one was about a man called Father William Doyle. And then I had one about the RMS Leinster. But this third one, um, Kevin Barry, is much longer. But this is about 18,000 words for my others. Were kind of introduction and they were 2,000 words. And again, all the details are right if you look. But Kevin Barry's story is so sad. I think in, in, you know, we had after doing all my research, I think he knew what he was doing and he wanted his mother decided to respect his voice. And so, so that's this day number one at the moment. What was your biggest challenge when it came to writing, Carly? <laughs> Writing in general or this book? In general. Well, the first thing is you have to be very disciplined when you're writing. And sometimes I would prefer to mop the floors than write. And sometimes, and I think everybody, every writer gets this, it's called writer's block, where you're wondering, what are you going to write about next? Now, as it happens, I've started a new book, which will be for a centenary in 2022. But the biggest challenge probably is being disciplined and making time. So, you know, when you have to write your essays for school, but you'd rather go and play football or go and dance or do something else. Discipline is, is one of my hard things. Um, so you have to set aside. If you're serious about writing, you need to have a notebook to, to put your notes into. Have that with you everywhere. And then make time in your day. Like you make time for your training or your um, visit to the library, whatever it is. Have a day and a time, or every day if possible, ideally every day. And if you can't think of anything to write about, look out the window and describe what you're looking at out there. So even if you only write a few words, do it often. And, and that's a challenge for most writers. We, we, you know, we, we have other things we have to do. And for me, I work full time as well. So writing is a hobby for me to be disciplined and I need hours and hours and hours every week instead of watching Coronation Street or something I go and write for, for half an hour and you won't get everything published you won't be happy with everything you write but that's okay it's about practicing and making it the best you can is that okay? Can you the question? Why do you like writing? Pardon, I didn't get the end there. Why do I? Do I? Why Sorry, I still can't get it. Why do write books about history, Carmel? They're wondering. Okay, so uh, I grew up up in Mayo, as I said, and it was an, a lot of oral tradition. So my grandparents, my father, my father's from a Gaelic area, uh, Tour McCady, and um, that was what we did. I'm making myself sound in the evening. No TVs back, back when I was growing up, and at the time. So I've always been interested in history. I'm a People think part local. I think if you're doing your research, just look around and see what's there to research. Um, history, I did my degree then, 
Um, after, after secondary school, I went to UCG and I picked history as one of my subjects. And then when I was working in the library, which I still do to this day in Dublin, um, I found that there wasn't a great selection of history books. Children had come in, they were doing their projects and things. And then I was finding brawny adult books and I was thinking, I'm going to write books. But my first three centenary books are books that have never been written for children before. Because why should you have to wait till you're 17 or 18 to borrow that adult book? But that, that was a motivator as well. But I love history. I do love history. And I love reading as well. So the two go together. I read. So for Kevin Barry, there were two adult books. One was written by a military man, Sean Cronin, back in the other one in the late 1980s by a grandnephew of, uh, no, a nephew actually, Donal O'Donovan. And they were my two sources. So if you're doing research, you have to have sources. And again, the library is the place to go. Um, and so I was reading those books. But then I had to decide, well, what's interesting for younger readers? And I hope I'd like some feedback if you get a chance to read the book. Um, it's aimed at your age, 10 plus and some adults are emailing me and saying they've read it because a lot of adults don't want to read heavy, heavy books. But this is written in a fiction style. There are 14 chapters and you could even read one chapter standalone if you wanted. So it has all the important facts about Kevin Barry. And I hope it's a little bit more readable, say, than a historian's book about him. But I'll leave that to you because you're the critics, you're the readers. Thank you. Anna, do you have a question? What was your favourite book as a child and who was your favourite author? Well, uh, my, when I say this to my children, they say get the violins out because there were no libraries near me in Mayo. In fact, when I was 12, um, the mobile library came to my village. And then, of course, I was like you when I was going into secondary school. So I couldn't even avail of the mobile library service for very long. And then the nuns, who were our teachers, the convent, they locked the library and we didn't get in there very often. So a favourite book, I, I'd have to say I loved um, all the Enid Blyton books. And for Christmas and for birthdays and things, I always got a book but we didn't have a huge selection. So if you're not a member of the library already, please join because even though you'll buy some books and you'll get gift books, the library has such an amazing, amazing um, array and variety and selection of books. Um, you don't need to be buying all your books. Obviously, as an author, I'd like people to buy books, but overall, for, go to your library and read, read, read without having... To, to pay for the books. So probably one of the Enid Blytons. I did love Mallory Towers because um, their life was so different to mine. I was in rain-soaked Mayo in the west of Ireland and they were in this posh boarding school over in England and I used to dream if I was in that school what that would be like. So Enid Blyton is still around. We still buy lots of her books in libraries and um, she writes for, for all ages but for me, in sixth class, first year, the, I think um, the Mallory Towers were, were my favourite. Thank you. Callum, do you have a question? Why did you become a children's author? So the children's become... author bit kind of came around by accident. Yeah, yeah, I got that, yeah. So um, when my children were small, I was make up stories for them, or obviously borrow books from the library as well. So I liked writing children's stories. But in 2007, I decided to do um, a writing course, not just for children's writing, but in general, just good writing skills. So I did a night class over a year. And then I started submitting um, articles to Ireland's own, if you know that, and to other magazines in Ireland, short maybe 800, 1,000 words. And then in 2010, I was listening to uh, Radio Nalifa in Dublin 
and I heard a children's author called Ray O'Lilish on, and he was looking for people to take part in the course he was running. So I went down to Clare weekend for six weekends, and part of our homework was like a part of the homework was to write a story. So I would have to stay in Clare overnight to avail of the class on Saturday and Sunday. And um, I started thinking back to my children and what they used to get up to when they were small. And I said to Ray, is it okay if I write for children? And he said, yes. So my first story, Spidey, it's a picture book that is based on an actual event. And there's a tip. When you start to write, write about what you know or an incident that's happen happened. So, um, you know, you don't have to go looking for um, highfalutin kind of things. Every day there's stories in your classroom, on your way home from school, over the weekend. I'm sure you get great stories on Monday morning. Very quiet at the moment, you see, Carmel. They can't do much at the weekends. I know. But you know what? The great thing about young people is imagination. So with me, it's life's experience at this stage. But imagination is there based on your favorite game. The day you thought the referee um, didn't make the right decision when you lost the county final, whatever it is, there are stories all around you. Little simple stories because people can identify with them. Great. Thank you. Lynn, you have a question, don't you? Are you writing any books at the moment? Yes. So this is what happens. You're only as good as your last book. So even when, when Kevin Barry went to the publisher, I had started researching an idea for 2022 because this is what I want to do now. Every two years, I'd like to have a centenary book. So this kind of ties you down a bit and narrows your focus because centenary means 100 years ago since something happened in this person's life or this event happened, but also that has never been written for children before. And that's where the library comes in handy. I can check and see is there a book about that person before. Um, so I'm writing one now about a lady who um, was very involved in getting the vote for women and... Um, I've just started researching that and hopefully next year I'll submit it to the publisher, Mercier Press. They might not want it. Not everyone is lucky enough to get something published. So um, sometimes you're writing for a year and then the publisher doesn't want your book. So um, I'm going to take a chance on this anyway. For um, You just reminded me of something there, actually, because you're all so well behaved. Kevin Barry was known as a quiet unassuming boy when he was in school but there's one incident that one of the uh, one of the girls who went to the girls school so the school was divided back then and I'd just like to read that for you maybe to finish and maybe if you have another question after that so um Kevin was quiet at school and uh, as I said to you and there's Edward O'Toole the principal his daughter Nancy uh, when I was doing my research, she had written this account of an incident with Kevin. So I'd like to read that for you because you are all so good and quiet. I couldn't imagine you do anything like this, but wait till we see what happens. So, although Kevin was known to be a quiet and assuming boy at school, Edward O'Toole's daughter, Nancy, recalls an incident of divilment that Kevin was involved in. She was coming back from the well with two very full buckets of water when she met Kevin and a friend. Can you imagine people going to the well for water? They didn't just turn their tap on. So she met Kevin and his friend, and as she explained, so these are Nancy O'Toole's words, the pair of them dipped their hands into the water and splashed it all over my long pigtails until my hair was soaked. I did not tell, that's the kind of thing my brothers used to do to me and my sister as well. I did not tell my father how my hair got so wet and I had to make up some story to keep Kevin out of trouble. <laughs> so in my book, I tried to include things like this that I think maybe you could identify with. Does that make sense? Is there any other questions? I am going to send on all the resources for schools, the quiz and things that you might like to do uh, to commemorate Kevin Barry this year. And... Um, I can send them on to Deirdre in the Carlo Libraries and she can get them to you, teacher, as well. Is there any last question or comment or anything? Have you 
Any advice to give someone trying to be an author? Trying to become an author. Become an author. Be observant, I think, is the first thing. Look around you. What happened in school today that could make a story? Did someone forget their lunch? Simple, very simple things. Every story obviously has to have a start, a middle and an end. Sometimes the end will come first, sometimes the middle. So plan. I started with the picture books and with picture books you have 12 doubles. So for me, I had to plan 12 pages. And the start of my first picture book actually happened. Um, so I would plan, look around me, and then maybe practice as much as you can, because it's only with practice you'll be happy with your your uh, your writing. And if you're planning, sometimes the plan will change. That's okay. The important thing is to keep at it. Don't give up. I think J.K. Rowling had something like 37 rejections. I'm not sure if that's myth or whatever but lots and lots of publishers rejected her and now we wonder what would the world be like without Harry Potter <laughs> so thanks a million thanks to Wicklow Libraries for allowing me in thanks to John and Deirdre and everyone in Carlo Libraries thanks to Teacher because I'm sure you had lots of important things to do today but hopefully you'll remember this son of your parish and you'll be proud of him in this centenary year and as I say have a look at my website and order some books from your local library yeah thanks very much thanks. Well, we're well, nice to well be part of it today thank you you're welcome to Fall to Rose thank you very much everyone um, you were a, a fantastic, attentive audience, and we'll talk to Miss Keys, and we'll look about getting a, a class set of the book out in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so you can you can all have a read of it, and then answer Carmel's quiz when she sends it on. Gurumila maha guiv guleir rangishe dvishiv guhuntuk arfad, and enjoy your upcoming midterm break. I know you're tired. I'm sure after the first. Six weeks back, so win tan box. Slan, August Bannock, Garmaga, Carmel, Garmaga, Rangishay, Slan.